All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Mining for Conflict Mineral and Chemical Data, How to Manage Critical Supplier Data, sponsored by EC Vision. I'm Marie Davignon, I'm Manager of Government Relations here with American Apparel and Footwear Association. Uh, as you all probably know, ASA is the National Trade Association for the apparel and footwear industries and their suppliers. We are best known for our advocacy and educational efforts on behalf of our members and the rest of the apparel and footwear industry. Before we begin today's presentation, I'd like to review a few technical aspects. If you're having trouble listening through your computer speakers, please dial in using your telephone. The number is located in the audio section of your control panel. If you are unable to join or having difficulty, please contact GoToWebinar support directly at 1-800-263-6317. One more time, that's 1-800-263-6317. All participants will be muted on today's call. If you have a question, please type it in the question box in your control panel. We will try to address all questions after the conclusion of the third presentation. Today's webinar will be recorded and available on the ASA website by the end of the week. A follow-up email containing a copy of the presentation slide deck, a link to the webinar recording, and a short survey of today's webinar will be sent to all participants. Your response is greatly appreciated as your feedback will enable AFA to continue improving the value of their future webinars. We have a great program lined up today, so let's get started. In addition to myself, today's speakers include Gary Baracco, Vice President of Marketing at DC Vision, and Chuck Riefenhoff, Managing Director at KPMG. As Vice President of Marketing for EC Vision, Gary is responsible for developing strategic product marketing direction and presenting the EC Vision brand and solutions worldwide. He also works closely with industry-focused organizations and cross-functional service providers to establish relationships that enhance EC Vision solutions to benefit its customers. He leads the marketing communications and execution team to support sales operations in the United States and abroad. Chuck is a managing director in KPMG's forensic practice. He has more than 40 years of diversified experience in regulatory compliance, investigations, broad risk management, governance, and board oversight. Oh, and more, sorry, I stopped reading. Forensic data analysis, forensic accounting, expert testimony, arbitration, and mediation. Certainly an impressive resume. He is KPMG's advisory lead for conflict minerals. Prior to his specialization in forensics, he was an audit partner for approximately 20 years. Chuck has served as an instructor in the firm's national and local office education training programs dealing with issues such as governance and ethics, contract compliance, accounting for leases and contracts, computer forensic and, forensics and auditing, statistical sampling, litigation services, and other dispute-related topics. He has been a lecturer for the Institute of Continuing Legal Education of the State Bar of Georgia and the Atlanta Bar Association. And now, just to get us started, I would like to begin today's presentation with some polling questions. We know we've talked about conflict minerals several times in the past, but it's still a really interesting topic to many of our members. To make sure that we're not repeating ourselves too much, um, we'd like everyone to take a few seconds to answer each of the following three polling questions to gauge your um, knowledge of conflict minerals. All right, two more seconds and wrap it up. Yeah. Rachel, can you go back to the results? Sure. <clears throat> this is our first attempt to do polling questions during a webinar, so bear with us, guys. So good afternoon or good morning, everybody. This is Gary Baracco from EC Vision. Um, it's interesting to see we talked about these polling questions, and as Marie mentioned, we wanted to gauge where everybody was at. Um, currently with their conflict minerals programs. Uh, and so 
we had um, three questions, so I don't know. Let's see how we could display these one by one, Rachel, and see if we can figure that out. Okay. <clears throat> We're on the third question now, which is, do you have okay. visibility into the supplier base and chemicals? Um, right. And it looks like we're getting in everyone's answers. Right. So far, 41% say sort of. <laughs> That's exciting. Sort of, yeah. Well, well, and this is great information to know because as we go through, um, the, the session is going to be divided into three different areas. And Marie is going to talk about the regulatory guidance. And then Chuck's going to talk about implementing, implementing this type of program. And then I'm going to follow up as the anchor um, on the relay team and talk about technology solutions. So yeah, sort of, 52% sort of have visibility into your supplier base. Um, that that's pretty interesting considering um, what we'll hear is that we only have a few months to kind of know for sure whether uh, we have that and how about the two prior can we take a look at those at all so how knowledgeable are you of the conflict minerals ruling well there's no Einstein's on the line with us today um, sharp but not perfect is the overwhelming response, and that's good because as much information that um, we've been feeding and other organizations that I know that you um, belong to, um, but there's still at least 10% who are lost in the muck and mire um, and another 39% that need help. And then one other question we had is have you adopted a conflict minerals management program? And that sort of, again, 27% no, 20% unsure, 11%, and 41%, um, you know, isn't a big number that you've adopted a program. But it's interesting when you look at this answer compared to uh, whether the people on the line really know much about it. So, so let's hope through, um, through the next uh, uh, 45 minutes today, we'll be able to answer a whole bunch of questions for you and at least give you a starting point and points of contact from three different organizations to talk further. Okay, jump right in there, Marie. All right, great. Thanks, Gary. Well, based on those results, I think we're going to go a little bit more in depth on the rules, just to make sure everybody is still on the same page. So as you probably all know by now, uh, Conflict Minerals ruling is under the Dodd-Frank Act. It was approved in July 2011. Um, it's Section 1502 of the Dodd-Frank Act amends the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 and directs the Securities and Exchange Commission, known as the SEC, to require publicly held companies or issuers to, to disclose their use of conflict minerals in those minerals in, that are necessary to the functionality or production of a product. The rule was enacted because of concerns that the exploitation and trade of conflict minerals is helping to finance conflict in the DRC region. So the rule requires these companies to file a report with the SEC disclosing that they have these products, or they have these minerals in their products, as well as posting it on their website. Now for what is conflict minerals, as we've talked about multiple times and we'll go into more details in the next slide, it's tantalum, tin, tungsten, and gold that come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and adjoining countries. The rule was effective January 1st, 2013, and the first reports will be due May 31st, 2014 for the 2013 calendar year. Enforcement is done um, under the, the SEC, under Section 18 of the Exchange Act, and it allows for, if you do it incorrectly, the SEC can can place penalties on your company, and it also opens it up for stakeholder investor lawsuits against companies that they feel did not disclose correctly. So with the final rule, there were several issues. The major issue is that there's no de minimis. There's no basic level for you have to have this much of the, prod of the mineral in your product. If you have any trace amount of the mineral whatsoever, you, ha or you have to follow the rule for this. Um, ruling and you have to report it. The other issues are all really about kind of murky language in the final rule, which is, is 
it has to be necessary to the functionality. Well, what does that mean? Is a zipper necessary to functionality? Probably. Is a grommet on a pocket? Probably not, but it depends on who you're asking. And again, necess necessary to production is the same issue. It's all up to the definitions of what that it means exactly. Also, another issue is the derivative. So you might not have, you might not even know that there's tin or gold in your product, but there's a very, very small amount, very, very small derivative that's put in there for some reason that your suppliers don't necessarily share with you. So the biggest issue with this entire rule is making sure that you can talk down all the way down to the very bottom of your supply chain to your suppliers and find out what is actually in these products. So as I mentioned, it covers four minerals. Tantalum, which is the first conflict mineral that was identified as an issue. Um, it was spiked in growth in the cell phone industry. And DRC currently provides 8 to 20 percent of global production of this. Tin, which is the biggest mineral used in our apparel and solar industry. And the DRC is the world's sixth largest producer of tin. Tungsten, is DRC is the world's fifth largest producer. And gold, the DRC provides 1% of global production. And here's just a nice pretty map for you to see the countries that are covered. So it is the DRC and then all adjoining countries. So Angola, Burundi, Central African Republic, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia. So where can these minerals appear? As I mentioned, tin is the most prevalent for our industry. So it can be in metallicized yarns. It can be used in buttons and zippers and other fasteners. You can see the list on the screen anywhere from underwires and bras to um, the solder and jewelry. It appears in electronics that are sometimes used in the apparel footwear industry. Um, my favorite on the list is glitter. Really, any it can be in several different places. Anywhere you might think of metal, tin is it's possible that tin is in there as well. So yeah, Marie. One there. of the things, um, excuse me. One of the things we've always <laughs> talked about in various sessions is um, we always talk about the Christmas sweater. Um, and how all of the metallic beading um, or any of the trim and, and embellishments on, you know, let's think of a Christmas sweater, for example. And while we think that um, that Christmas sweater might be the least likely product that would have a conflict mineral, it might be one that definitely does. So when you talk about next uh, uh, these metallicized yarns and the gold filament. Right. Um, Exactly, just as Gary said. So for the next three, they're less likely to appear, but of course gold is an issue, especially in jewelry and metallicized yarns. Tantalum, to some extent, is a composite material in watches and electronics. Tungsten, we're still trying to figure out. We haven't had any companies so far find out that tungsten is in their products, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not. It's just not prevalent in the apparel and footwear industry right now. So what have we done to help companies comply with this? We have on, you should go to the AFA website and there's a guidance that we've created for conflict minerals. It takes you step by step through how the rule works and how to comply. Um, once again, the first reporting date is May 1st, or May 31st, excuse me, 2014. So it's coming up pretty soon. We've also worked with several other industries to make sure that we're, it's, you know, this is not an issue that just affects us, it affects all industries. So understanding how maybe the toy industry is complying or the electronics industry is complying is helping us as well. And again, this is just for the guidance that goes through all these steps, how you can comply, understanding what the rule means. Right. Uh, we are still part of a larger task group that is going through this process. We did a lot of advocacy in the United States and now also in Europe as Europe is looking to do potential similar regulations. So as part of AFA's platform, not only do we help companies comply, but we're also looking to make sure that if these regulations are coming, that they are done so in a way that actually works for businesses and protects consumers and the actual miners at the same time. All right, so the next topic we want to talk about is the California Safer Consumer Products Regulations, what's also known as California Green Chemistry. It's really important that I, I feel like I need to point out that Green chemistry and conflict minerals are very different rulings. They're not done in the same way. 
Green Chemistry is not an SEC report or anything like that. However, they're both products of this trend from the government, from consumers, from NGOs, to ask companies to look deep into their supply chain and have a level of transparency that goes down all the way to their suppliers as to what's in the product. So green chemistry is just another example of a ruling that's out there that's requiring you to look as far downstream as you, or upstream, I guess, as you possibly can in your supply chain. The California green chemistry rule was created and enforced by the California Department of Toxic Substances Control, DTSC. It was proposed years ago and has gone back and forth on comment periods probably a dozen times in the past couple of years, but officially went into effect October 1st, 2013. Now it's interesting that it went into effect that day because nothing really happened that day. We're still waiting for them to come up with the final list of products that we have to report on, the final rules on how to report and things like that that I'll get to in just a minute. But I wanted to point out that though it's in effect, there's nothing to be done quite yet. So as part of the rules, DTSC will create a list of candidate chemicals. It's already done this on its website. Um, it has two different lists. One is the informational, or the first informational list, which is about 1,200 chemicals. And then there's an initial candidate chemical list, which is around 250 right now, which are the ones you actually should be aware of. DTSC will then analyze the candidate chemical list to identify up to five priority products. So it's only five products. And then any of the candidate chemicals that are found in those five priority products will be considered chemicals of concern. And if you make a product with a chemical of concern in it, you must then either perform an alternative analysis, prove that the product does not exceed the predetermined alternative analysis threshold level, or take the product completely off the market. So the DTSC will announced or published their list of priority products, these five products, in April 2014. And with that, they'll list their chemicals of concern. So they'll likely have it out before April, um, but we won't know until then what chemicals are actually on this list. The best thing companies can do for right now is go on the DTSC website, look at the initial candidate chemical list, which I mentioned is about 250 chemicals, because those will be the ones that will eventually be pulled into the priority product chemical of concern list. No reporting is done for them yet, no AA is due yet. However, you should probably be aware of what's on that list just as a preparation for it may, get, may hit you down the road. After they do the priority product list in October 1st, 2014, they will publish a priority product work plan that will tell you how to comply with the rule and how to do your AAs and what the threshold level is. The rule seems to have been done kind of backwards in this way. So first we have the rules in effect, then we have the priority products, then we have how to comply with the rule. Um, it doesn't entirely make sense, but at least it gives us enough warning time to be prepared for it. So as I mentioned, there is currently a list of candidate chemicals on the website. You can go on the website and search for it. It's actually a really easy to use database but I did just pull a couple of, a few examples of chemicals on the initial list that are relevant to the apparel and footwear industry. So you can kind of give an idea of how this works. We also have a guidance on this rule on the AFA website that you all can check out um, if you just go to the AFA website under resources. And it has a list of, it shows you exactly how the steps of this will work. All right, so next up we are going to have Chuck from KPMG. Now, just one thing, Marie. Um, sure. We're going to hold the questions until the end, um, but feel free again to uh, send in your questions through the chat box now. But we figured we'd, we'd band it all up at the end and see if we answered your question um, at the end of the session. Absolutely. Thanks, Gary. So yep. Chuck will be speaking on implementing a conflict minerals data management strategy. Uh, go ahead, Chuck. Thank you, Marie, very much, uh, and, hope, and good afternoon or morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this webinar. Uh, we're very interested in sharing with you uh, information, uh, not only uh, some of the base information about what is occurring, but also some of the more futuristic information regarding the audit and some of the uh, aspects of that. And as Gary said, we will have questions 
at the end, but please feel free to uh, shoot your questions in as we're going through this, and we can uh, we can hopefully maybe even address them on the fly. Next slide. In brief, what we will cover today is where are we, followed by what is an audit of conflict minerals report, and I can tell you there's a lot of interest to that. Uh, the industry responses, and then as I indicated, then questions and answers. Next. So where are we today? Um, this is a slide I have been using for a while now, and that little red arrow keeps advancing uh, towards the report date, which is uh, June 2nd, since May 31 falls on Saturday. And what's really important here is that the end of the first reporting period, December 31, is frankly gone. Um, so everything you're doing from now until you file either your form SD or your conflict minerals report or CMR uh, it will be designed to have your reporting ready and make sure you're ready for an audit if you uh, if you need one make sure your documentation is in place and gathering the important information uh, for instance information that comes from tools like Gary's regarding what your suppliers responses and what, it, what they tell you, and we'll deal with those what they tell you a, a little bit as we're, as we're going through this. But there are a few questions that you should raise within your own organization and think about where you are at this point. One of those, do you have a timeline established to finish? Uh, we have found organizations are starting to benefit from going out to the filing date and working backwards with the timeline so they understand how much work is, le is left to do and they're finding it's, uh, it's pretty significant. Which of course leads to the next question is have your resources been allocated and assigned? And that's both internal and external resources. And finally, do you know whether you will need an audit? And as you will see as we go through, these, through this presentation, how very important the answer to that question becomes. Next. So the purpose of this slide is to clear it all up. Uh, and of course that means all those regulations, 200 and some pages of them, everybody looked at, we boiled down to one slide. And I wish I could get away with that a straight face without start laughing. But, he, but here's what the slide tells you. It's basically broken up into three sections. The first section deals with if you're free of conflict minerals. That's a very important segment because that basically means you don't have to do anything, which is good news. The second segment is if you use the metals but you did not do not source from the covered countries, you will then file the form SD and its disclosures only. Then finally the third section is where a significant number of companies are finding themselves today is that they source or have reason to believe they're sourcing from the covered countries and they're not sure whether they're conflict free or where they have conflict or where they're undeterminable which is what we what we refer to as sort of the mixed bag and a key to this is what happens with the audit requirement related to those if you know that you're conflict free and sourcing from the countries or if you know that you're not conflict free and you're sourcing from the covered countries you will wind up having an audit for 2013. If you're undeterminable you will not have an audit for, for 2013. Next. So let's talk a little bit about disclosure requirements. This slide is also developed into three segments and it really helps get an understanding of, of what really is required. So if you are DRC conflict free or not found to be DRC conflict free, your CMR will have to provide descriptions of the measures that you took to exercise due diligence. Also, you have to have a statement that you have obtained an IPSA, independent, uh, third independent audit of the CMR, identification of that auditor, and attached as an exhibit 
the uh, IFSA report from the auditor. And we will talk about in a few moments what those reports are and what they look like and the import of those. So if you just slide over to the middle column for just a second, you'll notice the first four bullets are exactly the same. And the point is that in the future, after 2015, you will always have those bullets. And in, in, in addition to those, you're then going to have to describe the products that are not conflict-free, the country of origin, the source of those, if you know them, and the description of the facilities used to process those. So where are most people today? Well, most if you asked me earlier, I would have said most, everybody's in the undeterminable. And in the undeterminable, you get a little bit break because what you really have to do is describe the measures that were taken to exercise due diligence. And this is, this is interesting, steps you have taken or will take. And that's important because that is disclosing to the, to the public what you intend to do in the future to mitigate the risk against using conflict minerals or mitigating the risk that the conflict minerals are uh, supporting armed conflict. In addition to that, description of the products and you've, you've, that are undeterminable, the country of origin, and the description of facilities. So, so if you look at this all in sort of a one picture, it really is a pretty good roadmap to tell you the content of, of what is going to be required for your, for your conflict minerals report or CMR. Next. Um, Chuck, before you move on, or you can move on, but I just want to add, um, when we first met um, and talked about um, how KPMG works with brands and retailers and organizations, it was amazing to understand that the level of complexity that goes into it. Uh, and, and this type of information is great. And, and I was just sitting there looking at this, this conflict minerals report and, and seeing the volumes of data that brands and retailers really need to capture and to uh, report on. And, and so thanks for sharing that with us, because I don't know that many of us have been exposed to the level of detail. I th Gary, I think that's a very interesting comment. And, and I will tell you that um, a lot of companies are finding themselves not well prepared, partially based on exactly what you're describing, because the, the information that's required and the disclosure process that's required is, is causing significant use of resources. And, and we are finding a number of organizations, I would say a large number of organizations, are now asking for more and more outside help just for the very reason that, that you're describing. It's just phenomenal what you have to go through to gather the information just to be able to, to disclose, for instance, in the, in the undeterminable category. And one right. of the things we, what we recommend that companies do is start with your family of products as disclosed in the 10K as your basis for beginning to decide what your disclosures look like. And try to not have to go below that family of products to meet your disclosure requirements simply because it's just a lot of effort. Uh, let's right, turn. so what's happened here, Chuck, is, you know, we've got so many cross-functional um, teams within a brand or retail organization that need to come together. Um, legal needs to work with the sourcing teams um, that then need to work with the supplier base. And that's where, you know, typically these organizations, yeah, sure, your sourcing teams are working with your suppliers, but you're not digging deep into the, the tier three and four supplier to actually find out if there's some derivative, derivative of a 3TG that's in, that's sourced from a country uh, in the, the DRC region, uh, and then feeding that information back up to your legal teams so that your corporate legal teams then can do these disclosures to the SEC. So this is something that, you know, isn't quite typical. So all of these processes are unique for us, the, the brands. Yeah, and, and you need to add to that not only the corporate legal team, but the SEC disclosure group. Uh, right. because uh, this is, in fact, a filing 
Uh, and so the SEC disclosure group, uh, most likely the uh, disclosure process will be brought to bear here. Internal audit, um, IT, uh, all these groups uh, are being required to, to work together it, to, to meet, that, uh, meet that particular deadline. That, 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 that's a great point. Thanks, Gary. I don't want to get too far off topic, but just Marie mentioned earlier that we need to understand it's a clear differentiation right now between conflict minerals reporting and the California green chemistry, but the likeness is that California green chemistry means that as a brand and retailer, you're going to need to dig deeper into your supply chain and produce something. Additionally, um, we, we haven't even talked about the SB 657 and the potential uh, federal ruling that ties into human trafficking. And if that passes sometime um, this year, then there will be another SEC filing for brands and retailers regarding human trafficking and transparency into their supply chain from th for that. So having all of these processes and first an understanding of the rules, then um, working the processes and how to do these determinations and filings, and then, um, of course, the tail end talking about, well, how do I collect and analyze and, and produce that data is, is going to become more and more commonplace in uh, the apparel and footwear space. Yeah, and you can add to that the, of course, we all know that California has passed their own version of human trafficking, uh, but you can add to that the uh, European uh, requirement that's under development. In fact, uh, our sources tell us that originally they thought it would be next year, meaning probably 2015, but it looks like something's going to be developed in 2014. The Canadian requirement, uh, which is, uh, close to being passed, which more mirrors the U.S. compared to the European requirement, the EU requirement, which is uh, at this point considered to be uh, much more extensive and requiring other, uh, other disclosures. You know, the, the concept here really is one of, of detect and disclose, so determine if it's being used and then disclose it. And somewhere along the line, someone caught on to the concept that if you force somebody to detect and disclose, you can then use the shame on me routine to try to get them to change what they're doing. And that's a lot of what's behind this particular, uh, this particular act and other acts to follow. The, the, um, the Form SD, and I'm only going to spend a sec, uh, just a second on the Form SD, it's been re-released by the SEC did not provide uh, much clarification around it. The form itself, frankly, is not that uh, is is not that difficult. There are disclosures that are required, which which uh, relate primarily to the uh, undeterminable and to the other disclosures that that we just talked about. There are two very important points to think about here. One of those is that you need to determine early who's going to be the signator because whoever signs this is going to want to know about the processes and is going to want to know what's going on because, among other things, there are Section 18 liabilities associated with, with signing the Form SD because it is an SEC filing. And the other is there, there may be an audit process against it. And so the, whoever, the, whoever the individual that's going to ultimately give representations to the audit, to, to the auditors, really needs to understand completely the process. Next. So having mentioned the audit a couple different times, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about it. Uh, and let's look at the next slide. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. And this is a good reference slide to keep around because it does provide some direction about where things look like for 2030 for 2013 and 2014, and where they look for 2015 going forward. Remember, 2015 is the period that says if you still don't know, if you're still undeterminable, you then have to have a new category called not determined to be DRC conflict-free. And if you look to the right side of this slide, you will find that after that transition, an audit is going to be required every time. So after 2015, there will be audits required. 
and there's some background here to share with you and, you, and you may be experiencing this yourselves. Originally, the concept was that companies would, ha would be undeterminable for 2013 and 2014 would be able to sort some of it out. But what's actually occurring out in the marketplace and companies in your industry, I, I can add, are finding out that they in fact do have a filing requirement. Uh, that they do know enough to, to determine if they're conflict-free or not conflict-free, and they're having to face an audit in a period of time when the audit was not expected to, to be addressed. There is an important item on this slide on the left side, second uh, box down where it says, some CM known to be conflict-free. So here's what's happening. And I'm willing to bet some of you have had this already. You have some suppliers, a minor number of suppliers, are telling you, "Yes, we're sourcing from the conflict. We're, we're sourcing from the uh, conflict areas. Yes, they're conflict-free." And while the rest of your suppliers are telling you they don't know, we're hoping the SEC is going to provide some guidance shortly, and that guidance will be uh, what to do in that event. It might be facts and circumstances, so you could be in a situation of saying, we only have a few, so maybe we don't have to do an audit, and we just don't know where that's going to come out yet. Next. So here's what's going on in the audit, and, and I'll, I'll try to give, you, give this to you at a, at a very high level. Here's what's going on. There basically are two audit objectives. One of those is whether your plan, your scheme sometimes is referred to, meets the requirements in all material respects of the OECD guidelines. Unrelated, and this is very important, unrelated to that objective is whether your description of the due diligence measures performed with respect to the period, of course, are consistent with the due diligence procedures that were undertaken. So let me endeavor to straighten that out. They're not related. So whatever your design is, if it meets the guidance of the OECD, that's going to be audited and the auditor will say, yes, that meets the guidance. What really happens in the second objective is whatever you write in your CMR is not only going to control the audit scope, but that's what's going to be subjected to the audit. It will, there will not be an audit that says you implemented your plan. That, that simply will not happen. Uh, next. So two very important points with this. Auditors are going to only audit what is related to the two audit objectives. They will not audit anything else. Language is extremely important. Auditors cannot audit best in industry, best in class. We have the best program around our competitors. They just can't do that. An important piece of information is that the AICPA task force, which we chair, is working on developing audited language, language that can be used in a CMR which, which can be subjected to audit. And in that process, we're gathering uh, on a no-name, no-industry basis uh, draft CMRs so that we can uh, give them to the task force to review and think about and hopefully come out with some additional guidance. So if any, if any of you would like to send me your CMR, uh, please feel free to do so. It's only for the purpose of redaction and sharing with the uh, AICPA so that they can uh, continue to develop this guidance. Next. So what is not in the, in the IPSA? First of all, you'll never see an audit report that says you're conflict-free or it's reasonable. Nobody's going to look at the controls and nobody's going to address whether the plan was actually implemented. In fact, the audit report that you will see will be larger in what was not covered than in what was covered. Now, think about for a moment, what's, what's an auditor going to do? Well, if you think about an audit contextually, it means they're going to get management assertions, test supporting documentation, look at evidence, 
that the work that was performed as described and get representations from management, not dissimilar to any other audit, except this audit will be highly specialized. And if you think about something else, remember I said about timeline and resources and do you have everything lined up? Since you have to report by June 2nd, you would want the audit finished by 1st of May, 15th May latest. So you can resolve any issues that are outstanding in time for the report. So you need to build that into your timetable too. Next. So hey, Chuck, just a moment. Yes. Um, after this slide, I'd like you to jump to because we're um, we're gonna we're running short on time. I'd like you to yeah. jump after this slide to the one that's um, lessons learned about your clients' processes. Perfect. Okay. Yep. And, and again, idea. to everyone on the line, all of these are be available at uh, weware.org, and uh, and they'll be sent. Uh, you'll be sent a link right after the webinar. So, so if you can just roll through on the slides, Marie, to get to. Uh, yeah, the client's processes because yeah, keep this going. slide is a great. Um, Stop right there. These are good reference slides, but then going here would be ideal. Yeah, so I noticed in the in the responses um, regarding where you are with your CMR program uh, that that like other companies, some of you are trying to figure it out, other companies are trying to trying to move forward. So if you just consider what's really required, and, and these are lessons learned, we have learned that the strategy is extremely important. Get the upfront scoping done. Don't do this on a division level. We've we've learned that's a problem. That's probable. Um, there's due diligence that winds up being required to be done because you didn't expect to be there. And I think this is very important and very important to what Gary does is that the supplier databases are not current. It's amazing how many of them are not, and that does cause problems uh, with Gary's group in terms of getting information and moving that information back to you quickly. Resource requirements are generally understated um, and there are substantial difficulties in getting information that you need from your suppliers. And I think those are probably the high points from that. So Gary, thank you for getting me to that slide and I'll turn it over to you. All right, Gary, you're up. Um, we're, Gary's going to be speaking about leveraging technology for conflict minerals data management. Unless we lost them. Gary? Gary, Gary? Gary sounds like he's really quiet, doesn't he? <laughs> That's never happened before. All right, well, well you'll probably... there you go. Um, <laughs> boy, I was halfway through my presentation. Now I'm unmuted. Um, and so, How'd that presentation um, go, Gary? <laughs> uh, it's great. Um, so uh, we will address everyone's questions because we have about a dozen questions. So if we don't do them while we're on the webinar, we will address them after the session. Um, so Marie and Chuck, thank you. You told us that, you know, first of all, we need to identify the three TGs in our, our products, that we need to perform some sort of reasonable country of origin inquiry and exercise all of this due diligence on on source of, of the materials that are in our products and the chain of custody, and then we need to file a conflict minerals report. Um, and that's great. There's a whole lot of work to do, but next slide will tell us that really if we collectively look at that, how do we implement this type of solution? Well, first of all, we need to establish our procurement standards and our supplier codes of conduct need to change. As a brand and retailer, you put out this information um, at least annually to your suppliers. But you need to ed uh, educate and advise your suppliers about the new changes regarding conflict minerals. And then your suppliers need to do the due diligence and do their product content declaration and tell you, okay, what's in this and where do I, where do I get that from and or where does my raw material supplier get their raw materials to make these products. 
And then as a brand or retailer, you need to then create a report. So let's look at those steps first. Next slide. So in order to actually be able to communicate with your suppliers, you need to have a database of all of the supplier personnel that should receive conflict minerals rule compliance materials. And typically, the compliance personnel will differ from the regular supplier contacts that you're working with. Uh, you might be working with, uh, you know, the, the costing, the, the, um, the, the sourcing teams that are not involved in procurement. So in EC Vision's uh, cloud-based platform, it, we have a point of contact tab. And so let's see what that looks like. We have a supplier master. Next slide. Okay, we have a supplier master, and within this supplier master, we then break it down further to have a point of contact. And this is like a full factory Rolodex. And this is free form text. Uh, there are data fields that are pre-populated. And you can put in all of the names. Um, go ahead and hit the animation on that, please. Um, you can hit the names for the point of contact for fire safety, for general compliance customs, EDI, and supply, or maybe for uh, the person that actually does the purchasing uh, for the raw materials that are involved. So this provides you with a full um, supplier point of contact list and that individual that you need to, to work with to do uh, your reasonable country of origin survey. Next slide. Then you need to communicate and collaborate and send that initial recurring communications to all of your suppliers regarding what your company's standards are. And every company is really putting a stake in the ground and saying, well, here's what we're going to do the first year, second year, and moving forward, for instance. How um, diligent are we going to have our suppliers really perform in the first year? Because this is a difficult task. But you need to communicate that with them. And then you need to require your suppliers to acknowledge and update all of the product information that you have on the products that they produce and the raw material components. Next slide. And there's animation in this slide, too. So in EC Vision, we have a documents library. And, and within this folder, uh, these folders of, of documents, you can designate and say, well, under my, stamp, my supplier management folders, I have a specific folder that is just for supplier co uh, compliance. And within that supplier co uh, compliance folder, I have a conflict minerals guidance document. The functionality exists in EC Vision that you can also see how many suppliers this was sent to, whether they downloaded it, whether they've acknowledged download. And then any discussions that are continuing around that will be inherent in the system. So we've built a lot of functionality around this documents library. So you're not just um, posting a document out to a portal and having the supplier download it. You're collaborating effectively with them. So what's our next step? Next slide. And let's move forward. Great. So in the material and supplier master data tables, this is where you're going to collect and analyze uh, product-specific data that's gathered from your suppliers. So your suppliers will use, that, use the OECD forms, for instance, that Chuck referred to, to actually determine what the source and how much of the three TGs are in any of the products and, and whether they're uh, used for functionality, all of the required elements. But then you need a place to capture all of that information and to report on it. So let's look at the next slide, which will show us a screenshot of EC Vision's solution uh, to, that shows you a material master. Now, Marie mentioned a grommet. Um, so in this case, this, uh, this grommet is sourced from two different suppliers that you see on the left-hand side. And some, one of the suppliers actually has uh, conflict minerals evident through the determination, whether it's needed for functionality, whether it contains metal, but, but all in all, is it DRC free because of the country of origin? So this data table allows you to compile information about the specific components and then have your, su your supplier's supplier uh, actually tell you what 
the subcomponents uh, and the minerals are within this grommet and determine whether it needs to be flagged for conflict minerals reporting. Next slide. We've also talked about other chemical regulations. So we talked about the California Green Chemistry Initiative. And um, some of us might have seen the Greenpeace report that came out a few weeks ago. And then most of us are familiar with the AFA, Restricted Substance List, or RSL. So regardless of what you're actually tracking and tracing within the products that are in your supply chain, whether it's for a restricted substance with, uh, in Maine or Oregon or the state of California, or it's substances that exceed certain levels, acceptable levels, um, that might be called out in an NGO report, or if it's on California's green chemistry priority product and uh, chemical of concern list that they'll be publishing next year. You need the tools to manage and report that data. Next slide. So the last piece is, is looking at the product master. And uh, in this case, what we've done is we flagged this product, this finished good, as a priority product as listed in the California Green Chemistry. And then when we click again, we'll drill down into the actual bill of materials. So go ahead and click for me, Rachel. And we'll look at the bill of materials, and we'll say, well, on this bomb, we have two primary components. We actually have the leather and we have the buckle. So let's see what's in the leather and the buckle. And we'll click again. And we'll drill down into all of the chemical composition and determine, well, within this buckle, we down on the bottom, we're capturing all of that data that says, well, you know, here are the different minerals that are evident and what their acceptable levels and thresholds are within the system. So we've taken a supplier and we've evaluated a supplier, then, then the product that comes from that supplier, and then the bomb and the raw material components that all go into each specific product and piece of the bomb. So this allows you to capture all of that information. The last step is, let's move on to the next slide, is having the capabilities then to report on this. And our reporting capabilities in EC Vision Suite are very strong and robust. So for instance, if you want to produce a report that tells you the number of suppliers that you have within the DRC or surrounding regions, the number of materials that are conflict-free or non-conflict-free, and then all of the related products that might be um, non-conflict-free. So you might automatically eliminate a whole bunch of products because they are definitely not, so, there's no raw material source from the DRC or any conflict regions or they might not even contain any metals, any of the three TGs. And then finally, what's really important is running a report, a yearly report on non-conflict-free products and determining what is actually you need, it is that you need to report on to the SEC. So this is how we're connecting all of the sourcing suppliers and sourcing with all of the legal and the SEC filing teams. Next slide. Um, also, we talk about ways to capture and exchange data because this is really important. And through EC Vision Suite, we allow this to be through integration. We're integrated with a lot of test labs, and I'll talk about that next. All of your external users can be entering in the information into the system or your external users as well. We can import flat or Excel files. We also have strong mobile capabilities, so you can use an iPad or other um, iOS devices to enter information and capture that. So the flexibility for your suppliers and all of your internal teams to report information is readily available. Next slide. I talked about the linkage. And EC Vision has connected with all of these um, compliance and testing partners. And these cover about 95% or more of all the compliance-related uh, services for the apparel and footwear industry. And what we're doing is pushing data back and forth so that you can report on all of the testing results or the, the compliance audit results between EC Vision's platform and these third parties. Next slide. So I think that's all I had to talk about. So now we can get to some Q&A. Great. Thanks, Gary. Unfortunately, we're 
running really short on time, so I think maybe we can take one question, and that's about it. Um, right. We've got four minutes. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, we'll talk fast. Okay. All right. Our very first question we received is, do you have a source for the slide discussing the level of conflict mineral production out of the DRC? Um, I actually don't have that source right now, but we can certainly pull it up and email it out to everyone. Okay. So the second question is more of just a comment on tungsten, probably not so applicable to AFA, but we have found tungsten in hiking poles and dart tips. Mm. That's actually really interesting. Um, we actually we do a lot of work with outdoor companies who make apparel but also make things like that, so it is certainly relevant to those companies. Yeah, Marie, and I think that um, uh, golf clubs is another, and EC Vision works with some sporting goods companies, so um, right. golf clubs is another area. And we have a question that says, do these rules apply to private corporations? <laughs> Gary, you want to take that or you want me to? Chuck? Yeah, I was going to say, I might make a remark on that. Uh, private companies are not required to report publicly, but what we're finding out is that the uh, public companies who, who need to get information from the private companies are asking the private companies to perform many of the same procedures because the public companies have to have something to rely on to, to report in their public documents. So we're seeing more private companies going through this process than I think anyone expected. Great. And, and, actually, and I guess as, as a wrap-up to, to the whole session is that, you know, what, it, what are the repercussions if we don't file and, um, you know, what could happen? And, and we don't know yet because down the road we don't know if the NGOs and the activist organizations are going to look for these filings and see whether um, any publicly traded or private companies are really trying to eradicate conflict minerals from their supply chain. And, and so I think it's going to be a good practice for everybody. Um, you know, I, I think we, we saw those poll results. Everybody, you know, 54% are doing something or, or another, but it, everyone has to be really keyed into the entire process. Um, look at the information that's available. Work with um, third party, whether you know it be a technology provider like EC Vision or a consulting group like KPMG, and of course our trade associations like AEFA are key to keeping us um, advised of what's going on around all of these trade regulations. Well, thanks, Gary. We really appreciate that um, that you have that much confidence in us. We're certainly trying to do the best we can to make sure that everybody's up to. Um, understand what's going on with regulations. We're happy to be a resource for anyone who needs it. Um, with that, I think that we're about out of time, so it looks like we'll have to wrap it up. I want to thank our speakers for providing us with such valuable information and all of our attendees for joining us today. Again, if you put a question in the question box and we haven't and didn't answer it, we will certainly respond via email. Um, and then again, you can email any of us directly. Our email addresses are on the slide. As a reminder, this webinar will be available on the ASA website by the end of the week. You will receive a follow-up email containing links to the webinar recording and the presentation slide deck, and please don't forget to fill out our webinar survey. Additionally, if you submitted a question, or I already said this, um, we'll certainly get to that. Be sure to check out www.wewear.org for more information on our upcoming webinars and events, and ecvision.com and kpmg.com to learn more about the topics discussed in today's webinar. Thank you again, everybody, and have a great day. Bye now.